Last week, we talked about faith, and in all of our groups, we talked about faith and sowing seeds of faith. You know, it was the parable of the seed, the, the mustard seed. Who enjoyed that? Anybody enjoy that? I mean, that was, for me, I needed that. I was preaching to my, myself in the mirror for that one. Um, and next week, next week, we're talking about weeds. How weird, right? We're talking about weeds. Well, I mean, but it was sowing and reaping. You know, it's, it's important to understand the role of weeds, because we're going to be in Matthew 13. There's this parable of the wheat and the tares, or the wheat and the weeds, however you want to say it. You can read ahead for next week. Matthew 13 is this parable. And here's the thing about, here's the thing about weeds. From a distance, they can look very beautiful. Let me let that sink in for a second. <laughs> weeds in your life, from a distance, can look beautiful. It's like they got little flowers, nice and green but you roll around in that stuff, <laughs> you ain't gonna be happy. You're gonna be itching and scratching because weeds are toxic, but they can look good from the outside. And so what we wanna do, and I, I'm not gonna preach ahead of myself, but what we wanna do is be aware that sometimes some things that look good when we get into God's word, they're, they're actually toxic in our life and we don't wanna live our life based on just showing. All right, so we're gonna talk about that. That's next week. Don't miss it. Okay, so now my favorite topic, maybe in the entire Bible, sowing and reaping. Can we talk about this for a second? Let, let's start it off. Let's start it off. Galatians chapter six, probably one of the best or better verses on sowing and reaping because it just sums it up so well. Galatians chapter six says this, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Now, I, I, went to, I went to Delta College, all right? When I got my A, I went to Delta College just like anybody. I'll go over there, some financial aid. Come on, hallelujah, all right? Because I was poor, okay? Yes, hallelujah. Get me some, get me some bog fee waiver. Get me some, come on, some young people know what I'm talking about. Let's go. And I took a plant science class, and I didn't know I was going to be a pastor back then, so I should have been paying more attention. I took a plant science class, and my, my professor was in there. Man, he was like... Weird, okay? He was a great plant science teacher talking like Batman's butler, photosynthesis. Pho, pho, why, you gotta, why you gotta be so pretentious, man? Photo, photosynthesis. I'm over here like Till Mater. Photosynthesis. Photos, mm, that's some good dirt right there. Mm, that's, some, that's some acid soil. That's some clay soil. Mm, photosynthesis. I'm like, what? this guy, weird, okay? Weird. And I'm 90% sure he may have been a pothead. I'm just saying, like, he, he came in like, si plant science. <laughs> <clears throat> plant science. <clears throat> I'm not making no assumptions, but he was coming in a little too excited to talk about trees, if you know what I'm saying. I am. Bro, chill. Photosynthesis. Think you're all distinguished with a, with a reefer in your head. Come on, get over it, get over it. Well, here's the thing. What we want to do, what we want to do is we want to hear about how Jesus taught us about plant science. Because Jesus taught about plant science too, all right? It's a little bit better, a little bit better. I mean, he had long hair. But, you know, it wasn't as bad as my, my, my teacher. So this is uh, Mark chapter 4. This is kind of our text for the day. We're going to read a lot of scriptures today. Uh, but this one is kind of setting up all of, the other, all of the other points we're going to make. Mark chapter 4, starting in verse 26, says this. He also said, this is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground night and day, day and night. Whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. All by itself. Everyone say, all by itself. Again, all by itself. That's an important phrase. It's an important phrase. We'll come back to it. All by itself, the soil produces grain. First the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel, uh, then the head, excuse me. And as soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it because the harvest has come. That word all by itself, um, I looked it up. The word is, is from the Greek and it is automatos. Automatos. Where do you think we get the English word automatic from? Automatic. It's just automatic. Automatos. It means all by itself. All by itself. The seeds grow all by themselves. But, but this, this is what I want you to know is we do have a part to play. We have a part to play. And our part to play is just sowing the seed. Hear me now. Hear this. Don't judge each day by the harvest you reap. Judge each day by the seeds you sow. Somebody talk to me. Somebody, somebody hear me. I hope somebody's hearing me. Don't judge the day that you're going through with the, with the harvest you're getting. 
but judge each day by the seeds you're sowing. And I want to tell you about how sowing works briefly, briefly. How sowing works. Let's talk about this. Sowing and reaping does not take a college education. It's actually so simple that anybody in the entire world can do it. Rich, poor, everybody, every culture, every people, we can learn to sow. So here's what you need to know. Uh, number one is this. Number one is this. You can start writing things down for me, writing things down just to keep in track with what we're doing. Number one, seed not sown does not grow. <laughs> That's mind blowing, right? It's so crazy. But seed not sown doesn't grow. Proverbs chapter 20 says this. A farmer too lazy to plant in the spring has nothing to harvest in the fall. What I want to teach you today is you need to focus on what you're doing. You need to focus on what you are doing. It's not what you want to do. It's not what you hope to do one day when you have time. Come on, somebody knows what I'm talking about now. One day, it's not about what your spouse is doing. Amen. Okay. Like, man, a lot of people think I'm going to get success or the things that I want through osmosis. You know, my wife's doing good, so I must be doing good. No. Uh, my husband's doing good, so I must be, no, hang on, hang on, hang on. You need to focus on what you're doing. That's when you see everybody else getting something that you want to have. Maybe you're looking for a spouse. Maybe you're looking for a job. Maybe you're looking to get in shape and you're seeing other people get these things, but you were too busy watching reels and thinking about it, and they were putting in the work. Okay, you need to focus on what you're doing, all right? We need to sow the seed. Thinking about something is not acting on something. I hope somebody gets that today. Number two, you reap what you sow. You reap what you sow. You, remember when the scripture said, you cannot mock the justice of God? You cannot mock the justice of God? This is God's justice. This is God's design in life is you reap what you sow. Uh, Genesis chapter one lays out the, from the foundation of the earth, this is the way it's been. Genesis chapter one, then God said, let the land sprout with vegetation, every sort of seed bearing plant and trees that grow seed bearing fruit. These seeds will then produce the kinds of plants and trees from which they came. And that's what happened. The seeds of hard work and wise budgeting are going to produce financial freedom, all right? So I'm trying to like bridge the gap between the way God set up the world physically to the way God's setting up the world spiritually the same way. Consistently, Jesus shows us from the natural, from the physical form of things and says that there's going to be a spiritual ramification for that. So the first one, the financial one, is you got to be sowing seeds of hard work and wise budgeting. That's what produces the financial freedom you're looking for. The, the seeds of committing yourself and your family to church and putting into practice that which you're being taught, that produces spiritual growth in families. Those are the seeds that do it. Reading the word of God to your kids. Come on, somebody. Reading the word of God to your kids produces normalcy of the things of God in the home and in their life. Come on, somebody. This is, this is too important. This is too important not to know that certain seeds change everything. We got to be sown. We can't just be thinking about it. You reap what you sow. We figured this out here at the church early on. And we noticed that, man, only one thing goes wrong, man, and we were just all bummed out. Oh, there was feedback in the, in the sound system. Oh, we're all bummed out. Oh, we didn't have something go right, so we're all bummed out. So we figured out a long time ago, we're going to plant seeds of joy instead, regardless. regardless. We're gonna put, because that's what we want to harvest, we want to harvest joy, so we're sowing seeds of joy. So it's written on the wall back there. We choose joy in every situation. I mean, because we're, why? Because we're sowing that seed into the house. We're sowing that seed into our lives, and we hope you take those values home with you. All right? We act on what we want to see. Some of you can put this into practice right away. I know I'm, I'm still teaching you the word at, in this section of the, but there, there's, there's application here. You can take this with you. That's why we offer salvation at every service. Not just every week, but at every service, at each service. And we always, always, bow your heads, close your eyes. Anybody wants to start a new relationship? We're sowing seed of what we want to see. If we don't look around and go, huh, I wonder if anybody's not saved in here. No, we're just sowing seed. We always give an opportunity. We always give a chance. And we've been so blessed at every single service for like years. Somebody's either committed or recommitted their life to Jesus for years in this church. Man, it's, 
It's mind blowing that when you start planting seeds towards what you want, you reap what you sow. But the next thing, this is kind of important too for hanging in there. Number three is this, you reap later than you sow. You reap later than you sow. Man, keep that, (laughs) keep that with you if you're struggling. Day and night, night and day. There's like three people who know what I'm talking about right there. Okay, day and night, night and day. Once, once you plant something, once you plant something, we just have to wait. You got to wait. You got to wait. Uh, James chapter five says this. James chapter five. Consider the farmers who patiently wait for the rains in the fall and in the spring. They eagerly look for the valuable harvest to ripen. Verse eight, you too must be patient. Now, when it comes to sowing and reaping, it is hard to wait sometimes. It's not just hard work to do the right thing. Sometimes the, sometimes the hardest work is doing the work and then waiting for the result to come. Man, it's frustrating to do hard work and not see any results for a year, for two years. But you always reap later than you sow. It's God's law. It's God's principle. We, we, we take those steps first. We have, to be a, we have to learn to be a people who, who love investing, not just retirement. You know what I mean? You got to love the process. We talked about this in months past. We got to learn to fall in love with the process of, of doing the right things before we see the results that we're so eager to see. We got to learn to love investing, not just retirement. We have to learn to be a people who love working out not just being strong. We have to learn to be, we have to learn to love raising our kids, not just showing off honor roll stickers, all right? You gotta put in the work on the front end. We need to love our spouse, not just love making. All right, I'm just, okay, I wanted to drop that one in, never mind. <laughs> too soon, too soon, too many kids in the house. Well, no, you love our spouse, not just the, yeah, anyways. We love the process, okay? <clears throat> <clears throat> We, we're okay. We're okay. We're, we're getting through. We have to learn to fall in love with the process, not just the outcome. Amen, husbands and wives up in here. <laughs> Day and night. Not, no, I was just playing. <clears throat> you take care of the, the process. The progress takes care of itself. The outcome takes care of itself. Learn to fall in love with, I just love to sow. I just love to sow. And, and, and this is the next part about, about sowing and reaping is number four is this. You reap more than you sow. That's just the way it is. This is a cool thing. Well, it's a good thing if you're planting good things. <laughs> Not if you're doing bad things. Well, I mean, you reap more than you sow. Strangely enough, God's justice isn't fair. It's not fair or equal. It's not one for one. It's one turns into a hundred. Okay. He always pours out more than we put in. Always. Always. It's God's nature. It's who he is. Listen to Matthew 13. We've already preached this scripture in this series, but it bears repeating. Matthew 13, 8 goes like this. Still other seed fell on fertile soil and they produced a crop that was 30, 60, even a hundred times as much that has been planted. When you're, when you're investing, when you're investing like in your retirement, it is completely expected that you're going to get more than you put in. Otherwise it's just a savings account. Like we all, we all know this, naturally speaking, we know we're going to get more, but then somehow we forget about this in the spiritual side of things, that we reap more than we sow. Like you see one of your friends get saved, it's actually their whole family that's blessed. Okay, there's, a, there's an exponential rate of return. This is a spiritual law. Every marriage produces on average 2.3 kids. You know, it's just, come on, how many more examples do you need? The average return on investment in your retirement is 10% per year. Well, just usually, okay? Just usually, all right? I know times are tough. It's going to be okay. But then we come into church and serve and give because why? Because it's our duty? No, no, no. Get this in your heart. God wants to bless you. He loves you. He wants to pour out to you. So we come in, we're like, oh, I'm going to check. Just do that. Got to do it. Just got to. No, he wants to return to you even more than you're giving to him. But he wants it to come from your heart. But just know this. He loves you. He loves to bless you. He wants to pour it out on you. The whole world illustrates this. When you plant one seed, you get 100 back. So when we pour our heart out to God, it's like, it's like with giving. You know, we give to him and he pours out amazing miracles. 
Amazing miracles that we get testimonies like this all the time. He wants to bless you. Like, picture it at home. Picture it at home. When little Johnny, your son, little Johnny, oh, beautiful, sweet, precious little Johnny, when he, when he remembers your birthday, oh, and he cooks you a little breakfast, oh yeah, and brings it to your bedroom, oh, now we're talking. And then you get up and, and see that the whole house has been cleaned, what do you do? You're grounded. No, you don't say that. No, you're pouring out blessing that he can't even comprehend because he's a kid, but you're a parent. You know how to bless your kids well, even a little bit better than they expect. They're like, five dollars, whoa. You're like, buddy, there's more where that came from. Okay, we'll take care of you. If you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more your father in heaven will pour out the spirit on you. God wants to bless you. He wants to pour it out on you. It's not a prosperity thing. It's just a thing. God wants to pour it out on you. If you know how to give good gifts to your kids, he's going to pour it out on you. Number five is this. This last one is important. Sometimes you reap what you didn't sow. Bam. Sometimes you reap what you didn't sow. This can be a really good thing. So in the scripture, Jesus talks about this too. In, uh, in John chapter four, it goes like this. He says, I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Well, hold up. I thought we were talking about, I mean, it's all on us. Well, sometimes it is, but sometimes you get things you don't deserve, good things. What about Jesus giving his life on the cross? Did we do anything to deserve that? No, but it goes even deeper than that. It goes even bigger than that. I sent you to reap what you've not worked for. Others have done the hard work and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. This happens in the home. This happens with your kids. This happens with your family. This happens all the time. And it, of course, it happens with Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who died for us, even though we did nothing to deserve it. Sometimes we reap what we didn't sow. But this can be a hard truth as well. This can be a hard truth as well, because sometimes you reap what, a, a bad thing. Sometimes, sometimes we, call, we fall on hard times at no fault of your own at no fault of your own and, and is undeserving and it didn't, you didn't do anything to deserve it every time because if you only stick with you reap what you sow, then sometimes a hard time will come on you and you'll be like, oh, what did I do? I did something to deserve this. No, not, all, not always. Sometimes you reap what you didn't sow. So what's important to keep in mind with all of this is you can only do what you can do. And what can you do? You sow good seed. I, sometimes I reap what I didn't sow, but I know my role is to sow good seed. That's all I do. That's, that's my job. It's the kid with the fast metabolism. Let's talk about this kid, all right? <laughs> Nobody likes him. Nobody likes him. <laughs> He's reaping what he didn't sow. He was born with it. He was, and I should know, I am that kid. Nobody likes me. It's all right. I'm just, I'm used to it. I'm, I'm used to it by now. I, gotta, I see a, there's a couple more of you. I see you too. It's all right. Skinny kids unite, okay? The world's against us. The world's out to get us. Um, but here's the thing. Sometimes... <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes people say, I wish I had your, your metabolism. Okay. Do you also wish that you went to the gym six times this last week for an hour and a half each day? I bet you don't wish that. All right. Because that's, that's the way I live. I mean, I, my, my story, you know, I, I had a weight loss journey. I talk about it a lot because I'm obsessed with it. You know, you have to bear with me. So I gained a bunch of weight during COVID. I, I, and, I, and so I put myself on a diet and I, and I started working out a lot, you know, and, and, and so I was like in the best shape of my life a couple years ago, best shape of my life. And, and someone told me, a, friend, a dear friend of mine, you know, was just like, oh, you just, you just got your man bod. You just grew into your man bod. And I look at him like, did you not know that I spent 22,000 hours in the gym last year? Do you not know I cut out all sugar and bread for the last 12 months of my life? Tell me, I just, oh, I could have just, I didn't have to do anything apparently. You know, it's like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm getting through the offense right now. I'm still working through it. You know, I'm pray, you pray for your pastor. He's like kind of grouchy sometimes, you know, and he's like working through that. My point is this. My, my point is this. Never let your blessing or your curse dictate how you're sowing. Yeah. Man, whether you got the fast one, the slow one, whether you got the good job, the bad job, you a lot of money, the poor money, don't let your blessing or your curse dictate your sowing. Yeah. Just, do, just do what you can do. That's the point. Even though sometimes you reap what you didn't sow. It could be good or bad. All right, so... Let's grow in the sow here. Sowing is growing, and so I want you to grow. I want you to have some things you can take with you. So let's put this into practice because the world says we ought to do one thing, complain, be selfish, get mad, and, and that all those things will grow if you plant those things. But, so, but let's sow the best things in life. Let's sow the right things in life. Number one is this growing in fulfillment. 
Growing in fulfillment. I want you to grow in your fulfillment. And this is what the world says. This is what a lot of guys say. <laughs> I'll find fulfillment in what I can accomplish. All right, ladies say it too. Ladies say it too, it's all right. But I, I hear men say it the most about their jobs, about their career, about how much they earn, whatever. It's, it's I find fulfillment in what I can accomplish. Men do this so much with, with work. I hear it on a consistent level. Um, but trying to find fulfillment in your career is a fool's path. It's a fool's path. Paul, the Apostle Paul, who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, wrote this scripture that we're about to read, and his profession at the time was making tents. I don't think he felt called to be a tent maker. He was just doing it to make ends meet, but then he wrote this right here, Ephesians chapter two. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. What's my point? My point is this. Paul didn't let his career interfere with his calling. And Paul didn't say, oh, well, because I'm not, you know, in the ministry, you know, I'm not fulfilled. No, he, just, he didn't let his career define him. Somebody's got to hear that today. I want somebody to get that into their bones today. What you do for a living is not what God created you to be. Free yourself from the need to, to have some big, glorious career where you feel totally fulfilled. He was making tents. I don't think he cared at all about making tents. He cared about eating dinner. You know what I'm saying? Like He cared about making ends meet. He didn't let his career define him. Listen, don't let your career define you. So this is what I want you to do. Be who God created you to be. That's the seed. Just be who God created you to, to be, no matter what you do for a living. No matter what you do for a living. Just do what God, once you clock out, man, and then go for it. Then you, got, you have the time. Be like Paul. Made some tents, and when he got done with that, he went on with his calling. I don't think he did very bad. <laughs> you know what I mean? He did a good job with his life. You can do the same thing. Find your fulfillment in your God-given design. We help people do this through our growth track, which is on the 17th. By the way, come on, somebody's going to be amazing. But we help people find their design, discover their purpose, personality profile, spiritual gifts test. Take that, and it doesn't matter what you do for a living. Man, even before I was a pastor, I was a pastor. Okay, I, I, was, I was waiting tables. I was working in warehouses. And I was, I was counseling people. I was talking with people. It wasn't like official, but I would like, I'd be working with them. I'd be doing stuff with them. Um, and before I was a pastor, I was a pastor. And one day, if I'm not a pastor for a profession, I retire. My identity is not in what I do for a living. It just so happens that, that it's lining up right now, which is great. It can, but it doesn't matter what I do for a living. I could go work at Costco, be a pastor. Let's go. I probably even... Do pretty good financially, too. Come on, Costco. Shout out to Costco right now. Taking care of their employees. <laughs> Hope the general manager is watching, because if I offend too many people, then I might be working there. It's going to be okay. I'm just saying, uh, I, I, even back then, I worked for the weekend, because what gave me fulfillment was serving in the youth group, was, was, was helping with worship, you know, was, was leading my group. You know, I loved it. I loved it. And, and being a pastor was nowhere on my radar. Nowhere on my radar. You know, our, our pastor kid and Lori sat us down one day and just said, hey, you're going to pastor the church. We've only been married three months. And we're like, are you sure you heard from the Lord on that? Because we don't know what we're doing. <laughs> you crazy. But it, it didn't matter to us. It didn't matter to us. And so sow the seed of just being who God created you to be no matter what you do for a living, all right? Just do that. All right, number two is this, um, growing relationships. Growing in relationships, so important. I want you to grow in your relationships and I want you to sow the right seed there because the world teaches us and tells us to treat relationships a certain way. That if I, that if you do for me, then I'll do for you. All right, if you meet my needs, then I'll meet your needs. That's what the, from birth, this is kind of how we're taught to interact with people. This is the world's way. It's the sinful way. It's not God's way because God teaches us to, to treat relationships a little different sacrificially. Sacrificially. Don't believe me? I'll prove it to you. John 15. This is my commandment. Jesus speaking. This is my commandment. Love each other the same way I loved you. How did he love us? Crazy good. Sacrificially. How did he love us? He loved us first. He loved us first. He loved us without exception. All right. Boundaries and love are not the same thing. 
He loved us without exception. Yeah, he, he loved us without keeping a record of wrongs. Even other places in the Bible, it keeps no records of wrongs. That's all planting seeds. When we love people like that, that's planting seed. That's planting good seed. So again, as a pastor, I've, I've met with and counseled some crazy people, all right? None of you are all good. You're all, none of you crazy. Of course, it's all second service. They all crazy, all crazy. I know you normally come to second service, but that was the Holy Spirit led you to this one. Second service, all crazy, all crazy. I've met all kinds of crazy people, um, uh, crazy guys, crazy girls, uh, crazy black, white, Mexican, crazy, crazy skinny, crazy fat, just all crazy, all crazy people. And when I am across the table or on the other side of the phone with a crazy person, I like to remind myself, I'm crazier than they are. Uh, there's a great chance I'm the craziest person in this room. All right, there are parts of my story I can't tell you. All right, or I can't tell you on camera, or I'll tell you next service, come second service, I get a little bit looser in second service. I'm just letting you know. Just letting you know. That's why it's a smaller service is because, you know, they know all my stuff, all right? I, I remind myself, God loved me, and I'm crazier than you. So I can love you, reminding myself, God loved me first. I can love them. You see what I'm saying? Like, this is God's way. This is God's way. Um, number, number three is this. Uh, let's see if this one's off limits or not. Growing in finances. Growing in finances. This, this, is, the part of the, this is the part of the message, the great untouchable topic. Uh, this is where the self-proclaimed ultra-Christian, I don't need money. I just need godliness. Uh, yeah, I don't, I, don't need to, I, don't, I don't need no money, bow of poverty. I don't know who asked you to do that, but you don't need to do it. And there's this, there's this mentality we can get ourselves into where it's like, it's either, either you're rich or you're godly. I don't know where you read that. It's not, it's not the truth, all right? It's not the truth. This is, this is something that you can do to sow seed into your life and grow financially with, with maintaining your godliness, with maintaining, I do want that because the truth of the matter is some of us um, have a tendency um, if once we get a little taste and get a little money and, and start to grow financially, we can tend to, to break away from the things that we were devout to at first. And we don't want that, but that does not mean that you're not allowed to, to grow financially. So I want to talk about this because those two things are not mutually exclusive you know, being rich or being godly. It's not like one or the other. It's not that way at all. The common seed the common seed that the world tells you is get all you can and keep all you can. Get that seed and hold on to it instead of sowing it, all right? You've heard the saying maybe, it's not how much you make, it's how much you keep, keep. <laughs> That's the saying in the world. It's how much you give. <laughs> Got you all godly up in here. <laughs> First service, I'm telling you, you are more godly. Then It's okay. The saying is, the saying in the world is not how much you make, it's how much you keep. But this whole sowing and reaping idea that we got from Galatians 6 Spoiler alert, this was a financial context it was given to us in. Let's read it together, shall we? Galatians 6 says this, For those who are taught the word of God should provide for their teachers, sharing all good things with them. I don't know if I'm getting myself in trouble right now. Verse 7, don't be misled. So from that, he's talking about giving. He's talking about giving to the church. He's talking about giving like at your local church. And then he says this, don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. You will always harvest what you plant. So when Paul says this next part, he says, so let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, you'll reap a harvest of blessing. If you don't give up, what's he talking about not giving up on? He's talking about generosity. He's talking about giving in your church. He's talking about finances. We, I mean, it means more than that, certainly. But that doesn't mean we, we deny what it was intentionally written about. He's talking about giving. So the financial seed I want to share with you is this, that you can sow into your life. Be generous with your finances, giving God an opportunity to provide for you. Some of us, man, we, we, just, we don't even want to take that step. We don't even want to take that, that risk, all right? Uh, but what I'm saying is, man, give God an opportunity to show up. So that's why we do this thing called the, the 90 day tithe challenge. It's in the, all the seat backs in front of you. I was gonna grab one and show it to you, but you can see it. They're in the seat backs in front of you. And we, we like to take God up on his offer that we can, we can test him. You cannot test God in any other area of your life other than this area right here. And so we, we, uh, we accept that. In Malachi 3.10 it says, test, test me in this says the Lord your God and bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. So what this is, is this kind of radical. All right, well, we, we, for 90 days, we let you try 
tithing. If it doesn't work out, we give it all back. It's wild, isn't it? <laughs> it's, pretty, it's pretty wild. I've had people come up to me and say, that is weird. Well, then why did he put it in his word? Because he did put it in his word. It's the only place in the whole Bible where we are allowed to test him. So, hey, let's take advantage. I know how hard money is. All right. Our combined income when we started pastoring was like three grand between the both of us. All right. And we, and we still did it. We still went for it. Still gave. We've been giving since the beginning. And God has always showed up in our life. He's always provided for us. And that's the seed I'm trying to tell you. Give him an opportunity. Let him, let him show himself true. So I encourage you, if you've, if you've never uh, been, a, been a tither, or maybe you used to be, uh, we've had pe- a lot of people sign up for this challenge. And some people have signed up for it twice <laughs> because they tried it once and they were like, man, God's so good. And then it's like, oh, oh, life happens. You know, it's reality. Life happens like, oh. And then they sign up again and we're like, I know he's faithful, so I'm gonna do it again. And so I just wanna like let you guys know, you can all sign up for that and we, we will honor our side of that. We will, we will let you test God with finances because he said we were allowed to do that. Amen. Okay, so this last one, last one, last one. Growing in endurance. Growing in endurance, so important. This is when, when, when pain and hard time comes in our life. The common seed of the world would be to get mad at God. Why did you let this happen? Why did, why did you let this happen? God, why aren't you showing up for me? It never fails. When things are going good, we take the credit. Oh, you know, I'm just working hard. You know, just, just, you know I've been showing up to church a lot. So yeah, it's, it's on me. But when... When things go wrong, it's like, God, where are you? How come you're not catching me? But God has something to say about this, and it's actually very beautiful. I don't know if if any of you have, you know, familiarized yourself with this passage, but it's a beautiful one. This is such a good one. Psalm 126. Psalm 126, verse 6 says this. Those who go out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy carrying sheaves with them. You know what a sheave is? It's a harvest. Man, what he's saying in, in the Psalm is like you're going out into the field weeping. Like life is hard. It's going down. I, I lost something. I lost someone. And you go out into the field <laughs> sowing, sowing. Those who go out into the field weeping with seed to sow will return with, oh, God was faithful. He met me in my dark time and he came through for me. They will return with songs of joy, with sheaves of harvest in their arms. That's what I want for you. I want you to to experience the blessing that God is faithful. If we continue to do what's right by him, even when we're weeping, even when we're filled with sorrow, even when we're facing that, that extremely hard time, which I know many of you are. It's hard right now. Life is hard right now. Things are crashing down. It's it's hard. If you go out sowing, if you go out sowing, you're going to come back with sheaves of harvest. You're going to have a blessing in your arms, and you're going to have a testimony from it. It's going to be amazing. Man, man, endurance seed is this. Keep sowing, and you will reap a harvest of joy if you don't give up. What did he say about it? If you don't give up, don't give up, everybody. Lifeline Church, listen to me. Don't give up. Dory said, just keep swimming. I'm telling you, just keep sowing. Just keep sowing. If you're experiencing loss right now, just keep sowing. If you're experiencing the pain of rejection right now, keep sowing that seed. If you're experiencing loss, just keep sowing. Uncertainty, tragedy, hard times. Just keep sowing and you will reap a harvest in the 11th hour when you thought it was too late, but it's actually not. God's going to come through for you. You will go out into the field with sorrow on your face, but if you go with seed to sow, just keep sowing, just keep sowing, just keep sowing, just keep sowing, just keep sowing. sowing. Remember when I told you that, you know, when, when we became pastors, I didn't expect it. You know, but the, but the dark side of that story was, you know, I was here in the church and I was serving. Some of you remember this. Some of you were here before I was a pastor. So you know, you validate this story that before I was a pastor, that things were actually kind of tough, you know, because of my background, because I have a criminal record. I, I wasn't able to, you know, get a lot of jobs. I was getting turned down, you know? So I was working in, like I said, warehouses and waiting tables because I couldn't get a real job. And here I am 
trying to marry the woman of my dreams. But, you know, even my pastor, you know, my, my future wife-to-be's dad are all telling me, hey, bro, you got you to gotta figure that out because I'm trying to give her away to some guy who can't even pay the rent. This is real. Like, this really happened. And I'm, I'm over here working part-time minimum wage at a Salvation Army trailer. This is the only job I could get because of my background, because of my... Cr- and I'm over here serving God. I'm over here tithing off of my little tiny peanut job. I'm over here, I'm serving every time the doors open. I'm serving in here, I'm on the youth group, I'm on the worship team, I'm giving, my whole life revolves around God. And I'm getting shot down. Job after job after job after job. Some of you remember this, it was a hard time. I was, because here's the truth, I was looking up to God like, God, what are you doing? Where are you? Like, can you even see me? You're suffering servant, <laughs> you know? That's the attitude I have. I was like, where, where are you? Just keep sewing, sewing, sewing. I remember times in that stupid Salvation Army trailer. Just upset, man. Writing songs on my, you know, bring my guitar. I got something to do. And so I'm writing songs. They're all sad. <laughs> you know what I mean? What a joke. I know, I know what you feel like. I know what you feel like. I know you feel like, God, do you see me? I'm over here trying. I'm doing the best I can. Just keep sowing. Just keep sowing. Keep doing the right thing. Keep showing up. Keep reading to your kids. Keep praying for your kids. Keep praying for your marriage. Keep sowing the right seed. Showing up. Time in. Time out. Just keep going at just the right time. At the last second, our pastor shows up and says, hey, we're going to make you pastors of the church. I'm like, this is unbelievable. Unbelievable. I cannot believe it. People wouldn't believe me if I told them. You believe me, right? It was wild. I'm, I'm giving you that. I'm giving you that. I learned in that season, and now I have the experience and the authority to tell you that sometimes you go through a drought and you just keep sowing seed. And one day you wake up and you reap a harvest of blessing if you don't give up. I wonder if anybody's tired in here. I wonder if anybody's tired of waiting and you need need a little encouragement. Let me me pour some fuel in you. Say, "He's, he's he's coming, he's coming for you. He sees you, he absolutely sees you. He has not forgotten about you. He hasn't forgotten about your family. He hasn't forgotten about the desires of your hearts. He sees you. He has not forgotten about you. And it's time to sow the seed today. Recommit yourself. Let's just say it. It's time to recommit ourselves to God. And maybe for the first time. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Father, we come before you today grateful and thankful for what you've given us. Lord, and we receive this word today and we're ready to give it all to you and sow that right seed. So if I'm, if I'm speaking to anybody, anybody who needs to recommit or commit their life to him, if that's you today, would you just lift your hand and say, that's me, I'm ready, to, I'm ready to come home. Yes, I see you. Yes, amen. Yes, I see you. Amen. Anybody else giving their life to Jesus today, recommitting their life? Does anybody need a breakthrough? Come on, let me see you. Let me see you. Amen. You are seen. Amen. You are seen. Hallelujah. Church, let's pray this together like a family. Let's pray it out loud together. Say, Father God, I give you my heart. I give you my life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Make me new. Thank you for sending your son for dying on a cross for me. I receive the free gift of salvation. Amen. 